sermon lesson this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15. If you would please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, we pre preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the majesty of the resurrection of Jesus, for all of the the hope that it offers us. May that resurrection be real to us as we look to your word this morning. Speak to us in our hearts and in our minds through your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. John Irving, the American novelist, wrote this in uh, one of his novels, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Anyone can be sentimental about the nativity. Any fool can feel like a Christian at Christmas. But Easter is the main event. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you're not a believer. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a fan of the notion of sort of simplistic monocausal relationships, the fancy word for it, uh, what uh, Jonah Goldberg sometimes refers to as one-thingism, right? This, this sort of idea that everything has a single cause behind it, right? There's one cause for the war in Ukraine, or there's one cause for why the guy cut me off in traffic, or whatever, you know, th there's always a simplistic explanation. I, I just, the world is a complex place, and it's never just one thing going on. The good news, the gospel about Jesus Christ is a complex thing. Salvation is complex and multifaceted. Any, ask any of the guys in the men's Bible study, they can tell you that I can get on a pretty good rant about someone reducing salvation to justification, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of justification by faith alone. It's very important. But salvation is multifaceted in the Bible, and it talks about it in a lot of different terms. Things like election and regeneration and adoption and sanctification and glorification, along with justification, and a few others. And we, we need all of those things to be saved. But if, if we're going to try to reduce the good news to one thing, or I, th I think if the Apostle Paul were to reduce it to one thing, and he may tell me I'm wrong one day, but I'm, I'm betting I'm right, it would be this, it would be belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is to say, I think, I think John Irving got it right. Today we're looking at the very first part, the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. It's an entire chapter, extended chapter, where Paul focuses exclusively on the resurrection, on the nature of it, and, and the truth of it, the reliability of it, of the resurrection of Jesus, and the hope of our own resurrection. And it's the very thing that we're gathered here to celebrate today. Now we're going to see three basic things, I think, uh, about the resurrection in our passage. And the first is that the resurrection is central to the gospel. Uh, it's literally what makes the good news 
good. The second is that the resurrection isn't so much a, a theological concept as it is a historical fact. That's really what Paul is arguing here. You can believe it or not, but the historical witnesses to the resurrection are significant and hard to ignore. And then the third thing is that the resurrection is actually also an intensely personal thing for Paul himself, but also in turn for us. So first, I I think you cannot talk about the gospel, you cannot talk about the good news without talking about the resurrection. And that's true for Paul, it's actually true for us as well, because the resurrection is central, it's the key to the message. If we stop with Christ dead in a tomb, even if we're talking about his justification and forgiveness of our sins, he would still be like so many wannabe messiahs that had come before him and died and moved on. You see, the thing that sets Jesus apart and the thing that made Paul a preacher, the one that became a proclaimer of the good news, is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That doesn't happen. We don't get here. So Paul begins by summarizing the message of the gospel that he's been faithfully preaching to this church in Corinth. It's something that he says he he received and he's passed on. It's not something that he made up. And his preaching and his message sort of stand in as part of a tradition which the Corinthians themselves inherit from him and which we do as a church as well. And it's by this message, by this good news, that we are saved. But note that the content of this message, right, verses 3 and 4 in particular, we see a formula for a very basic creed. And there are actually echoes of this creed in the Apostles' Creed, which we will recite in just a few minutes. Most of the learning in those days was done orally. Students were delighted to sort of memorize and recite things over and over again, repeat them. And so creedal formulations were very important, and we see a very early form here. The next thing is that everything that Paul cites, it's it's not just historical events, it's also in accordance with the scriptures. He says that several times, Jesus did not appear in a vacuum. He was the Christ, the Messiah, that is someone that was foretold in, in seemingly a thousand different ways in the Old Testament. Right, this promise shows up in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 16, Hosea 6. Those are just a few that passages that Paul probably has in mind here, but there are plenty of others that would apply as well. And so Jesus' life and his death are no ordinary life and death. And that's just not just because of who he was, but because of how he fulfilled this long tradition of prophecy. So Christ is the culmination, if you will, of the history of God's work to rescue his people. But the key thing here is you have to pick up on the trajectory of the creed. Again, it's all focused on historical events that culminate in the resurrection. So first, Christ died for our sins, right? That's that justification part that I was talking about. He takes our place on the cross. He was innocent, but he died for us. Then he was buried, yeah, put in a a cave that's cut out of solid rock with a big stone rolled over the front of it and a, you know, a, a platoon or whatever of Roman soldiers assigned to guard it. He was really, right, he was dead and, and, and in a tomb. And then he rose on the third day. At three days, the body starts to decay. So Jesus was really dead But then he really rose. He rose bodily from the grave, not just a spirit or a a ghost or whatever. So there is no gospel, though. There is no good news without this last fact that he rose from the grave. Because if it isn't true, if there's no resurrection for Jesus, then there's no resurrection for us, which would mean that we weren't actually ever saved by Jesus' death at all. And as Paul will remark a little later in the chapter, in verse 19, he would say, if, if it's not true, if we don't believe in this, in this, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Folks, if you don't believe in the resurrection, if you don't believe it's true, you've got better things to do with your time than pretending like you're a Christian. It's, it's really that simple. Now, the sev- second observation is that the, res- the resurrection is historical. It's not a myth, 
it's, it's not a good story. It's not a, a spiritual story or a spiritual account. It's all based on factual, historical, verifiable events that really happened. And there were eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus, quite a few of them. Notice that the people that Jesus appeared to are named specifically in a number of cases. There's, there's Cephas. Cephas is Peter. That's just an Aramaic name for Peter. There's also the apostles, James, the brother of Jesus, and at one point, more than 500 people, which obviously would include some that wouldn't be quite as biased, so to speak, as the apostles. That's a, that's a lot of witnesses. Furthermore, at the time that Paul is writing this to the church in Corinth, these people are all still alive. So if they doubt that he's telling the truth, just go to Jerusalem and ask a few of them. And they tell you, I saw him. He was real. So there's plenty of people that can be consulted about the facts of the resurrection. And this may be hard for you to believe, but I think people would have probably been even more skeptical about the resurrection of Jesus' body from the grave then than we are now, if, if that's possible. The Corinthians were like most Greco-Roman people of their time and world. They believed in an afterlife, to be sure. It just was not a physical one. They believed that their souls or spirits departed their bodies, went to a, a netherworld-type place, and lived on in this sort of dreary type of unhappy existence. But dead bodies always stay dead, which was, I mean, you know, pretty reasonable premise given the overwhelming historical data they'd observed. So Paul would have been quickly dismissed as essentially a raving lunatic if he didn't have such remarkable evidence for his, crane, uh, his, uh, his claims. It's kind of easy for us 2,000 years to removed from the situation to think all of this was concocted or that ancient people were naive, right, and would buy such a story. But when it's too easy to verify and they really don't believe this is possible, no, they're, they're not idiots. The gospel would have been completely discredited. The early church would have never survived if these basic facts didn't have a lot of evidence that they were true. Now, I suppose a healthy skepticism is in vogue these days, and I've noticed that it is particularly acute anytime anyone makes a claim about an objective truth, particularly one that maybe isn't based on science. In other words, people seem likely to doubt you when you claim a lot of evidence and facts to back up your case of your story, and rather they're a lot more likely to believe you something when you don't make any particular truth claims about it at all. And I think there's sort of a simple pragmatic reason for this. People like to believe stories that don't necessarily need to be true because they're convenient, they're, they're useful, they're good stories. Right? It's good to believe in something when it helps me accomplish my goals. Even Ted Lasso knows this. If Jesus works for you, if Buddha works for you, if just plain love works for you, it doesn't really matter if these things are real if they help you be a better you. On the other hand, if something, if you believe in something that's real and true and you have to stake your claim on it, something that others don't actually accept as being real and true, then that requires a degree of commitment. It, just think about the notion of the attorney that has to defend the murderer, you know, that's being tried very publicly, and everyone is sure that he's guilty. It's not a popular position to take, even if you're right. In other words, it costs something to believe in Jesus and his resurrection. Now, I don't mean that you're paying for your faith or earning it or anything like that, but if Jesus is real, and Jesus really died for me, then I have to admit that there's something wrong with me. Not just something wrong with all of you, <laughs> or something that's wrong with the guy that cut me off in traffic, or the other people in this world. It costs me something. It costs me some pride, some self-righteousness, because a man had to die for me. 
So Christ's death is free grace. It's, it's payment for my sins, but I have to admit that I need saving. Are you ready to admit that you need Jesus? Now, the last observation about the resurrection is that it, it is, it's also intensely personal. It's not just a, a concept. It's not just an event, because it doesn't stop with Jesus, and it doesn't stop with the apostles. Because Christ's resurrection paves the way for other people, like us, to be saved and to rise from the grave, too. And by saved, I don't just mean like sort of an abstract spiritual or psychological type of concept, although there certainly there is some of that involved. But when you are saved, you are rescued from very real and destructive circumstances in your life. And the gospel, this hope of the resurrection, actually transforms the real lives of real people, and it does so with the power of the resurrection in us. Note how Paul is the last person to whom Christ appears, and how this leads Paul to reminisce on his own personal testimony of transformation. Right? The gospel isn't just a historic creed for Paul, although it's certainly that. It's not just good theology. It's not just a series of events for Paul. The gospel is his life, and his life is very different because of it. I, I don't know if you notice how he described himself as one untimely born. The ESV is being polite, I guess, here. This is not a polite concept that he uses. The Greek is referring to a miscarried or aborted baby. That's the term he applies to himself. It may be a way of referring to himself as a freak. It, it sort of takes on that sort of connotation a little later in the language. At any rate, this is, this is not a nice or complimentary term at all. And the basic gist is that Paul is saying he was like a dead baby when Christ appeared to him. And the gospel brings spiritual life from spiritual death. He may have been outwardly alive, but inside he was stone cold dead until a resurrected Jesus appeared to him. And that's what we all are before Christ brings us life. Paul says that explicitly in Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But from this abnormal birth, Paul goes from being a persecutor of the church, of God, right? One of the most, I mean, to, well, to, to one of its most ardent preachers. And I would say it was a bit of an understatement when he says his grace to me was not in vain, because it's an amazing transformation in his life. I mean, he goes from seeking out Christians to have them stoned to death, to preaching the very message that he hated so much that he thought was blasphemy and was false. And all of this is by God's grace. How else could you explain it? Look up the account of Paul's conversion in Acts 9 for yourself sometime. He's on his way to Damascus, he's riding his donkey, and he's going there to persecute more Christians when Jesus appeared to him. Certainly one abnormally born. Just as a side note, realize that this makes Paul a hostile witness to Jesus' resurrection. The most convincing kind of witnesses there are. He really did not believe until Jesus showed himself directly to him. The resurrection changes people, real people, individuals like Paul and you and me. We are united to Christ in the gospel, and, and that's our common ground, but we are still, indeed, we're a great diversity of people, a wonderful complex of stories and personalities. Sometimes I get the impression from people that they think that becoming a Christian is going to, I, I don't know, homogenize them make them sort of a copy of something else or someone else. Reprogram you, maybe. It couldn't be further from the truth. The Apostle Paul stands as one of the more remarkable personalities in history, so much so that people have actually tried to psychoanalyze him based upon his writings. He's not an ordinary guy. Even as remarkably as his life had been transformed by Christ, he remained a unique and blazing testimony to Jesus Christ. 
I want us to think further about this transformation that happened to Paul for a second, because it really is a remarkable thing. So I, uh, back when we lived in Louisiana, when I pastored there, I had some friends that I used to hang out. Uh, I, I, I used to use a coffee shop to work in. I had a booth in the back. And there were some guys that would come in and sit there and talk with me in their morning coffee before they went on to work. And one way of the, one of them, a guy named Bernie, was talking about, I don't remember how he got on the subject, but he was talking about how he used to be in favor of the death penalty, but the recent uh, results of DNA evidence that had uh, acquitted some criminals that were on death row had changed his mind because he just thought it would be so terrible for anyone to die unjustly for a crime they didn't commit. He just couldn't bear the thought of that. It's a very understandable perspective. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Paul to suddenly realize that Jesus really was the Messiah, that he really was the Son of God, and that all of his persecution, right, all the people that he had stoned, that he participated in their deaths, they were really innocent and they were right. Paul thought they deserved blessed for death for their blasphemies. And now he realizes that Jesus really is God because he's standing there talking to him. This guy that was crucified, perhaps that he even saw crucified, had appeared to him in the flesh. Think about what the reality of the resurrection did to him. It would have made him painfully, brutally aware of his own guilt and shame in these awful crimes that he committed. And yet somehow, he was freed from that guilt so that he might go on to preach the gospel. I mean, how amazing is it that he didn't just become suicidal after that? Only the love of God shown to him in Christ's sacrifice and the fact that there is a hope of resurrection for him and for the people that he contributed to their death, only that could give you hope in the face of those kind of sins. What have you done that's as awful as that? I'm willing to bet most of you haven't done anything as awful as that. Is there something in your life that you're horribly ashamed of? You know, one of those things that you would love to yell do over about whatever you said thought or did are you plagued by guilt and shame the cross of christ can free you from that jesus died for that and he rose from the grave and you and i can have the same peace and transformation and joy that paul had so the reason that the resurrection of jesus christ is such good news is that it offers us the hope of a new life, a do-over, a world beyond this horribly broken and disfigured one that we live in. And like Paul, we often need an escape from the things that we have done. We need a way out. We need a hope of a better place. Sometimes from the things that have been done to us. And the thing is, where Christ has gone, we can go too. Right? That's the power of the resurrection to save. This is the promise that Jesus made to his disciples in John 14. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you there myself, that where I am, you may be also. Friends, the gospel really is about the hope of the resurrection. There's this, there's this story uh, about the great Australian explorer, uh, James Lindsay Taylor, he, he, ex he patrolled the sort of the central highlands of New Guinea in the 1930s on behalf of the Australian government. He made contact with one of the last people groups of the sort of modern world that were completely isolated and still living with sort of Stone Age level technology. He flew in in a plane and as he was leaving their lands, there was one New Guinean man that tied himself to the fuselage of Taylor's plane with vines. He told his family that even if he died, he had to see where that plane had come from. He wanted to know what kind of world that could be. The resurrection of Jesus is every bit and even more so extraordinary and revolutionary to us than the plane was to that man. 
The resurrection is, of Jesus is the hope of something that's almost inconceivable, and yet something absolutely necessary for our lives. It's an opportunity to see a world and a life that we can only long for. It changes everything. It gives us hope of a world and a life without gossip and slander, without war and terror, without rape and murder, without racism and hatred. I could go on. It's a world without guilt and shame, a world where we no longer harm those that we love the most or fear harm from them as well. Friends, lash yourself to the fuselage. Cling to the hope of the resurrection of Christ. This is what saves us. Tell yourself the faith over and over again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of the resurrection, for the inconceivable moment where you did with your Son that which we so desperately need. As we go through the days and weeks of our life, as we struggle through the brokenness of our Good Friday world, help us to fix our eyes on the hope of the resurrection, be transformed by our, our faith in Jesus that we may follow where he has gone. Lord, we ask that you would make this real in us, as real as you made it to the Apostle Paul. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's now stand.